How do? Hope you're all well. Um, wanted to um, shoot a quick episode just in regards to some stories that have been doing the rounds for a little while now. And they haven't sat right with me. And um, I think they deserve addressing. Um, and those stories in the world of football are to do with uh, Chelsea Football Club and their manager, Graham Potter. And the rumours are, whether they are true or unfounded, that given recent results and the style of play, Potter's position might be under threat. Now, that might come as no surprise to a casual on onlooker. You know, managers are sacked all the time in the Premier League. You don't get the time to build anymore. But Graham Potter was only appointed earlier in the season. He was appointed just a couple of weeks after the transfer window closed in September of this year. He's been in the job for, you know, a matter of months. And we are now on a hiatus, on a mid-season break, because the World Cup is upon us starting this Sunday, which is just bizarre. I will be doing a very short World Cup preview, um, releasing to you guys very soon, because it's the eve of the World Cup, so we need to cover that. Um, it's the very nature of, of the Potter situation does not sit well with me at all for a number of reasons. And I think it's important that we don't believe the journalist fodder that is thrown our way. You know, the sensationalist journalism that we are fed, the, the clickbait sound bites, the, the headline um, that, they, that they put out there just to try and attract readership or viewers or listeners or whatever it might be. I just think it's completely out of order the whole situation with Graham Potter. Um, and I think I think we're in real danger here if there is merit to this. And the reason for that is, you know, you've got to be of a certain vintage to remember Chelsea um, before their current era of being successful and a glamour club. You have to go back to, I guess, the late... Certainly the late 1970s, early 1980s, when they had uh, Ron Chopper Harris in midfield. Um, I mean, for a long time, Chelsea through the 70s and the 80s were sort of a yo-yo club. They were sort of stuck in the second division, would get promoted to the first division, go back down to the second division. They hadn't won a major honour since I think it was 1971 FA Cup final. Um, and And that team had been broken up because the club had been in... Um, you know, deep financial peril. Um, they'd been bought famously for one pound. They had a chairman called Ken Bates, who looked a little bit like Santa Claus from Miracle on 34th Street, if anyone wants to put him into Google. Um, very aggressive businessman. Famously bought Chelsea for one pound. Chelsea didn't even own their, their, their ground, Stamford Bridge. Um, there was threats that they might be, uh, be homeless. Um, the ground was in disrepair. The pitch was terrible. You had Chopper Harris kicking lumps out of players through the 70s. And going into the 80s, because the club didn't really have any money, um, yeah, they were a little bit of a mess. Like I said, yo-yo club, really. Until the early 1990s, where the stock market crashed. Um, Ken Bates was able to negotiate some solidarity um, in regards to the ownership of the ground, which at least meant they had security as to where they were going to be playing. They had a famous uh, businessman fan called Matthew Harding, who effectively bequeathed the club a lot of money, sort of 20 or 30 million pounds, I think it was, which back then was, was astronomical sums. When you consider that transfer records were sort of in the two to three million pound um, sort of value you know you're talking huge amounts you know tens or hundreds of millions of pounds in today's money and he effectively gave that to the club in a very very clever ways that businesses can sort of loan um money to other entities in a way that they'll never get look to get it back but effectively he gave the the club a huge amount of money they attracted um former england international glenn hoddle as a manager Glenn started implementing a slightly more attractive style of football. And if you have to remember that Glenn Hoddle was underappreciated in this country, he was loved in Europe, really appreciated in Europe. 
and he started putting together a team. I think he brought in Dennis Wise as his midfield general. He had, uh, if I remember correctly, Frank LeBeouf at the back, sort of uh, uh, a very stylistic French culture defender, very good at taking penalties. He had a pacey forward line with John Spencer, you know, much more attacking style of play and started turning Chelsea into a more aesthetically attractive team. And it was through Hoddle's influence that they were able to attract Ruud Hullet, who, although he was coming to the end of his career, and this is a former Ballon d'Or winner, he'd won the European Championship with Holland, Champions League winner, or European Cup winner with AC Milan, fantastic footballer, household name. And this was just at the start of the era where foreign imports into the Premier League um, were just starting. Dennis Bergkamp at Arsenal, um, Cantona obviously at United a couple of years before, and now Hullet at Chelsea. And this was really the start of Chelsea becoming a glamour club. Um, they'd had a few years, of course, of doing not very much. Glenn Hoddle got them to an FA Cup final against Manchester United. Ruud Hullet took over in the summer of 1996 because Glenn was appointed England manager after Euro 96. And that was the era where, through um, a lot of borrowed money, Chelsea started going and bringing in foreign players um, under Hullet's management, the likes of Zola, Viali. Um, I think it ended up with the likes of Marcel Desailly coming to the club. Didier Deschamps came to the club. They won the FA Cup in 1997, which was their first major honour in more than quarter of a century. Um, qualified in, into Europe. Um, Gianluca Viali became sort of player manager. They won the Cup Winners' Cup. They won the League Cup. Um, they won the FA Cup in 2000. And suddenly they were becoming a successful team. They were getting regular success. Some European honours, you know, multiple domestic trophies, regularly sort of hitting the top six. Getting household names like Jimmy Floyd Hasselbank. As I said, Didier Deschamps joined for, for, you know, French World Cup winner. World Cup winning captain. Marcel Desailly. A young William Gallas. John Terry was coming through the ranks. Um, Chelsea were starting to establish themselves as a, you know, a serious club. Not necessarily a title-winning club, but they were definitely there or thereabouts for things like the League Cup. They were a serious entity when it came to the FA Cup. They were playing in a mixture of the Cup Winners' Cup, which we now know as the, Euro you know, the, the Conference League. Regulars in what was the UEFA Cup, which is now the Europa League. So they were, they were growing in stature. Um, they brought in Claudio Ranieri, the Tinker Man. And, you know, he is the one that started to get them established into what was the top four. Um, he was the one who started to get them into the Champions League. The foundations of what become Chelsea's glory years happened under Ranieri's watch. He was the one who brought in Frank Lampard and was building a team which had a mixture of English and British players and also some, some sprinkling of foreign players on there as well. Chelsea were a decent side. Um... Chelsea fans, of course, are used to a period of success. You know, you have to remember that Roman Abramovich, I think he bought the club, is it 2003, the end of that summer? So it's been almost 20 years now of sustained success. And yes, overnight, they went from being, you know, a decent sized club to being right up there as one of the richest clubs in the world, able to buy anyone they wanted. And for a while, they were just going on transfer sprees. You know, they were buying... Joe Cole, Adrian Mutu, Michael Essie and Didier Drogba. They were spending 20, 30 million pounds on players willy-nilly when most other clubs would maybe be able, at the very top, would maybe be able to buy one or two players. Chelsea were buying six or seven. And if that wasn't enough, in the, in the next transfer window, they would go and buy a few more. And they fast-tracked themselves to uh, being a competitive club, Got, getting to the Champions League semi-final with Claudio Ranieri, bringing in serial winner Jose Mourinho, winning league titles, league cups, FA Cups, getting to latter stages of the Champions League. And the, and the groundwork for the, for the next 20 years was laid. And, you know, respect has to be given to Chelsea in the fact that they have now had this model for 20 years. Um, that is enough time for them to no longer just be the fast track, you know, elbows out, bully, trying to get themselves to the top of the, of the tree as quickly as possible. 20 years is a long time. 
and they are now a serious club. They are now a global player. They are a massive club, a super club. They have elbowed their way right to the top of the English game. When it comes to household names and, and marquee stature and a brand and a global following, you have to respect that Chelsea are now at that level. They've also got the success to show for it. Two Champions Leagues, multiple Premier Leagues, multiple FA Cups, multiple League Cups, world champions. They are a serious, serious player. They are up there with Manchester United and Liverpool and Real Madrid and Barcelona and Bayern Munich. Um, so Chelsea fans have had it good for a number of years. And if you're a fairly young Chelsea fan, that's all you know. And there's a certain expectation there. And I get that. Not too dissimilar with what Manchester United had with Sir Alex Ferguson. Model was slightly different. Roman Abramovich had a, a core team underneath him. Bruce Buck um, and, and the rest of the team that he assembled to run the club on the daily. And their model was, if it wasn't working, get rid quickly and bring somebody else in. There was no sentiment at Chelsea when it came to getting rid of managers, very successful managers. Jose Mourinho delivering Chelsea's first league title in 50 years, winning it back to back. Uh, I think he ended up winning three league titles with Chelsea if I'm, across two spells, if I remember. He got sacked both times. Antonio Conte, he won the league, he won the FA Cup in back-to-back -back seasons. He was shown the door. Carlo Ancelotti, who's won the Champions League numerous times. I think he has the record for Champions League victories. He was shown the door. So, if things are stagnating, or the results or the performances aren't there, Roman Abramovich is not, was, not, was not afraid to pull the plug quickly. Um, but that was a model for success at Chelsea. And respect has to be given to that. That's how Thomas Tuchel got the job in the first place. And his CV, very, very good. You know, he did very well with a number of clubs in the Bundesliga. In what is a very difficult circumstance, he did well at PSG. And he did very well at Chelsea. Methodical uh, coach, very tactically astute, won them the Champions League. Competitive in pretty much every tournament, every competition. Got to both domestic finals last season. If two penalty shootouts had gone the other way, he would have won a double with Chelsea last season. We're talking 14, 15 months ago, Champions League winner. We're talking only a matter of months ago for them to be world champions. So, very, very successful. Very, very methodical. Very, very astute. Very, very savvy manager. And what's a bit perplexing is because of obviously the war between Russia and Ukraine that's been ongoing now and the freezing of assets of Russian businessmen and women, oligarchs around the world, we knew that Roman Abramovich had to sell Chelsea. We knew that the main interested party, Todd Bowley, who obviously ended up buying the club, was interested. We knew that there were negotiations. This was not an overnight thing. This was something that had stages to it and progressed fairly organically, as any sort of major transaction does. So Todd would have known that there was an existing management team in place, and Surely conversations would have been had, especially when it became clear that an agreement in principle had been reached that he was going to buy the football club. So that covers things like the vision, the structure, the strategy, the style of play. What type of player do they want to bring in? What type of team do they want to have alongside, below and above the manager? And what's really strange is they continue to go and buy players and they continued to sell players and shape the squad as Thomas Tuchel wanted. Now, so the story goes... We know in the summer Cristiano Ronaldo wanted to leave Manchester United. There's a link in the descri uh, description to the other video that I shot, which gave a sort of initial reaction to his interview with Piers Morgan. Um, we know that Thomas Tuchel didn't want Cristiano Ronaldo. Okay, Todd Bowley abided by that. Who do you want then? And they went out and they bought Pierre Aubameyang from Barcelona. Now, of course, he used to play for Arsenal. He was prolific at Arsenal. Uh, he went to Barcelona. He did start off prolifically at Barcelona. 
they have history, Tuchel and Aubameyang, from their time at Dortmund together in the Bundesliga. So they went and bought Aubameyang at a very cut price deal because of the previous relationship between manager and player. Then barely a week, two weeks later, there was a parting of the ways. Thomas Tuchel's out the door, and Todd Bowley or Chelsea statement cited a difference of strategy, a difference of principle, a difference of vision. You know, there was a project, there was a long-term plan at Chelsea, and the owner and manager apparently didn't see eye to eye. Yet they'd just gone and bought a marquee striker. They bought Raheem Sterling in the summer. They sanctioned the sale of one of their creative young players, Billy Gilmore, to Brighton. Ironically, where Graham Potter was managing at the time. And they were shaping the squad as the manager, Thomas Tuchel, wanted. Yet, it seems odd that these discussions, fundamental, intrinsic dis discussions, were not being had at the time. And then it came to light that there was a fundamental disagreement and out the door he goes. Okay, so there's now a vacancy at one of England's or the world's most premier clubs. And for years we've had clamour for English managers to be given the opportunity to manage at the very top of the English game. They appoint Graham Potter. Fantastic. Finally, a young, uh, proactive, forward-thinking English manager is given the opportunity to show his worth at a really high-ranking club. Prayers have been answered. Well, now we have to consider the circumstance. The transfer window is shut. Um... We know that he had an interest in Billy Gilmore because he signed in for Brighton. Ironic that Billy Gilmore goes from Chelsea to Brighton and Graham Potter goes from Brighton to Chelsea. That's a real shame. The squad, in terms of its balance, makeup, profile of player, was um, in the previous manager's image. So a little bit of slack needs to be given there. We know that uh, the games were coming thick and fast. Graham Potter didn't have any experience managing at that level before. We're talking about the pressure of winning every match, which comes with managing a super club, being competitive and looking to try and compete for honours in all of those competitions. He hadn't had any experience of Europe, and now he has to go into the Champions League. Uh, and he didn't have pre-season. Now, a lot of fans have been very quick to jump the gun and say, well, you know, if you're a top manager, if you're a top coach, you should be able to be planted into a situation, think on your feet, set the team up. Maybe you have to be a bit pragmatic to start with. Um, we've seen that with Eric Ten Hag at Manchester United. We saw it with, say, Jose Mourinho at times in his career. You know, sometimes if you're only given certain tools to work with, you have to adjust and still make sure the team is competitive. There's an element of truth in that. But, Every manager was given a Graham Potter opportunity earlier in their career. Jose Mourinho did very well at Chelsea when he first joined and when he came back. But in both instances, he was inheriting a squad that had been together for a little while. He was inheriting a squad that was on the ascendancy. He was uh, ascending a squad that was in latter stages of Champions League in the case of when he first joined to Chelsea. He brought a number of key players from Porto with him. So he was able to have a team in his image already and he went and bought players as well but also Jose was more experienced than Graham Potter he'd been in the game that little bit longer he'd managed more clubs than Graham Potter and in terms of building teams in his image with a track record of success he had done what Graham is doing now beforehand so when he went to Porto, he didn't walk into Porto and suddenly they were the best team since sliced bread. It was a work in progress. He needed to be there for a few seasons to build that team of Deco, Pala Ferreira, Benny McCarthy, all the players that came in and helped him to win uh, the Portuguese League, help him to win the Champions League. Um, and that infamous Porto team of 2004 took a couple of seasons to put together, having Costinha and having uh, Manish in that midfield he didn't walk into that overnight. He built that team. And that's what Graham Potter's doing now, sort of with one hand tied behind his back. He's walking into a club that is in a state of flux. They've had a 20-year model with somebody at the very top and a structure of very trusted associates directly underneath. That model's gone, and they're sort of thinking on their feet. Sporting director and commercial managers and everyone who's going to become the new team are being appointed sort of in real time. You've got a manager... Uh, sorry, an owner, I should say, in Todd Bowley, 
who is doing what Roman Abramovich did 20 years before. This is his first foray into, you know, football club management. He's learning the ropes. He's learning the culture of England, which is very different from North American sports. You've got a team which is built in the image of a previous manager. Um, and you're walking into a team where the results hadn't been great, actually, under Tom's Tuchel for a little while. The style of play had been stagnating. Um, and Graham Potter needs to be given time to assess the players, to assess what is the best formation. He's very unfortunate that his two fullbacks, uh, Ben Chilwell and Rhys James, suffered injuries, long-term injuries, near enough at the same time. And they are two massively important players for how Chelsea... Uh, set up both in terms of how they get their width and how they look to attack, but also defensively as well. So he's having to think on his feet there. He's without arguably Chelsea's best holding midfield player, certainly for the last few seasons, in Golo Kante. Um, he's been out. He's been without Kovacic. He's had to kind of put pegs into holes without really having the opportunity to get to know the players in terms of their style, their character. How do they absorb information? What's their best fitness program? And he's having to deal with all of this right now at a level that he's never been at before, picking up pieces of the Champions League campaign that started under the previous manager. And how's he coped? Well, Chelsea are still in the mix for the top four. Although Newcastle look like they're on a run at the moment. Manchester United look a threat. Tottenham look a threat. Chelsea are still there in the mix. They've got to the next round of the Champions League. So in terms of an initial appraisal, considering the situation, considering that he's walking into a club that doesn't have that steadiness of 20 years of uh, structure, they probably themselves don't have the answers to support him if he needs a bit of help. Considering the injuries and the pressure, and he's now leaving Comfort Island, which was... Um, Brighton, that sort of mid-table mid kind of level of expectation, and now he's at the top level of expectation, I think he's done okay. I also think that we need to put a sock in it as well. We've been asking for so long for English coaches to be given the opportunity. Now we've got one. He's been in the job two months, in very difficult testing circumstances, in a era which has changed markedly from the last 20 years. So during Chelsea's most successful period, which is what they've recently just had. Normally, you would have two clubs for a number of seasons who were fighting it out between them. It was Arsenal and Manchester United when Roman Abramovich first bought the football club. And obviously, with their investment, coupled with Arsenal having a bit of a decline, uh, it became Chelsea and Manchester United. And then, through appointments, through Sir Alex Ferguson's retirement, United have sort of fallen away. Liverpool became... Uh, a regular competitor to actually win the title. City, with their investment, Pep Guardiola's arrival, have become, you know, the team to beat. Tottenham, now that they've got Conte there, obviously they had Pochettino as well. They've had a, a decent last few seasons overall compared to their previous 20, 30 years. There's a lot of teams. There's a lot of competition now. It's not like there's only one or two teams out there. If you finish above them, you'll win the league. Not at all. Arsenal are having a resurgence. They're top of the league. City are going to be there or thereabouts. They're second. Newcastle have just been taken over. Eddie Howe's doing an amazing job. They're third. Tottenham, excellent squad. Um, you could argue about the balance. You could argue about does Conte need to let them off the leash a little bit more. But, you know, with Harry Kane, with Son, with other players there, you know, they're in the mix. Manchester United look like they're doing better under Eric Ten Hag with the Ronaldo issue aside. Chelsea are there or thereabouts. You've got potentially West Ham or others who might put a run together. There's there's seven or eight teams that are going to be very close to each other this season. That's a different landscape as well. And there's the winter break because of the World Cup. And I think people need to cut Graham Potter some slack. I think the talk of him potentially um, getting the sack now is so premature, so unfounded, so unfair. After years of blaming, you know, managers who've got almost no success or, you know, the likes of Roberto Di Matteo, who came in as caretaker manager at Chelsea. Yes, he won the Champions League. He was gone a few months later. Only got a Solskjaer came in as a caretaker manager. You know, we've been asking for British or English coaches to be given the opportunity. Now that one is in the job, 
I think we just need to shut up, show a little bit of support, show a little bit of understanding for the situation, stop trying to get clickbait for unfounded rumour and conjecture, let the man do his job. He hasn't even had one transfer window yet. We don't know what's going on behind the scenes. We don't know if players have shown insubordination. We don't know if they've shown laziness. We don't know if they're carrying injury. We don't know if they were trying to reserve themselves because the World Cup is coming now. Uh, we don't know any of that. I think Graham Potter has done okay. I think once the players come back the other side of the World Cup, when he gets a couple of his key players back from injury, the likes of Kante... If Kovacic can get a run of games under his belt, his two fullbacks, Chilwell and Rhys James, suddenly you'll see Chelsea able to put their strongest team together, able to put a run of consistency together, where the manager can start to build that trust and that relationship that they'll carry out his instruction. Maybe there'll be some money spent in January. Certainly in the summer there will be. There'll be inbounds, there'll be outbounds. And what we'll see at the start of next season is a Chelsea very much in the image of Graham Potter and very much in the image that Todd Bowley was talking about indirectly when he referenced the strategy and the long-term vision for the club, part of the reason why Thomas Tuchel was sacked. We haven't got there yet. And I think for people to be questioning his position and for Chelsea to have had to come out recently and give the infamous vote of confidence, I think is absolutely ridiculous. There's been a handful of matches in very extraneous circumstances, in a season unlike any other, we are still feeling financial effects from COVID, where clubs are operating at a loss, where all that loss of revenue has not been filled. Um, we've got players who aren't fit at Chelsea. I think the whole situation and the whole room around surrounding Graham Potter is bullshit. Absolute bullshit. I think it's totally unfair. And it's going to make it very difficult for those vacancies to be filled by other English managers in the future. And it's almost like you can't win. You know, for years, the journalists were shouting out match of the day, football first in the newspapers, podcasts like this. Put English coaches in, give them a chance. Now we've got one, we want him sacked. Ah, oh, it's just totally madness. There'll probably be Chelsea fans saying, oh, you don't know what the fuck you're talking about, blah, blah, blah. Totally understand that the football is probably not the product you're looking for now, that there's inconsistencies in results. Perhaps Potter looks a little bit indecisive on the touchline. But there's a lot of reasons for that. He's missing half a dozen of his best players. He's got a squad of player, none of which are his own uh, choices. He's inherited them all. The club is in a state of flux. Managers would typically look to a sporting director or to the CEO or the owner or someone who would work above them and alongside them. So Alex Ferguson had Martin Edwards and David Gill for years. I don't know if Graham Potter's got that. It's only recently, around the time he was appointed, maybe actually slightly after, that Todd Bowley announced who the sporting director was going to be at Chelsea. So the structure isn't even there. Todd Bowley doesn't have experience of running a football team or working in this country. So I think Graham Potter, for his first foray into elite level management, into a situation which is a mess into a club that is in a state of flux, uh, into a squad certainly which is unbalanced, into a situation where the confidence would have been low anyway because of the style of play and inconsistency of results under the previous manager, and given the fact he's without a number of key players due to injuries, I think he's done okay. And I think sometimes Chelsea fans need to stop. They need to put the previous 20 years to one side and give this guy a chance. Give this chick guy an opportunity to get through the World Cup, to get to the transfer window, to start playing to the latter stages of the season so that he can actually get players back to fitness, so he can actually put his mark on this team, so they can actually start playing in the image that he wants them to. And when he comes up against some of the bigger teams, when he comes up against European heavyweights in the Champions League, we can start to put a little bit more of a judgment on him then. But even then, we need to wait until next season, when he's had the opportunity to spend a bit of cash, when he's had the opportunity to move some of the players on, when he's had an opportunity to put his foot down on the training ground and say, anyone who is not with me is gone, or however he's going to manage that situation. And when the club and when the team are more in the image of what Todd Bowley wants and what Graham Potter wants, that's when we can properly start judging this situation. And until then, I think we need to shut the fuck up. We should be grateful and happy that a young, forward-thinking English coach is managing one of our biggest clubs. He's been given that opportunity. 
He hasn't sunk yet by any means. Let's just give the guy a break. Let's just give the guy a little bit of time. One of the things that we're complaining about now is that managers aren't given time. Give the give him some time. Anyway, let me know what you think. If Chelsea fans want to disagree with me, feel free to. But I happen to think that it's a little bit premature just to say after a handful of games to a, to a guy who's walking into a state of flux that he's no good or he's not up to the task, considering the previous manager wasn't doing much better anyway. Anyway, let me know what you think. As I say, link to the Cristiano Ronaldo videos in the description, and I will be uh, releasing the World Cup preview episode very shortly. Until then, catch you soon.